For more than four and a half millennia, the Great Sphinx has gazed out over the shifting sands of the Egyptian desert, standing guard before the Great Pyramids of Giza. Standing 20 meters high and 73 meters long, the giant stone statue bearing the body of a lion and the head of a man is amongst the most famous and celebrated relics of the ancient world, and indeed one of the most enigmatic. For centuries, tourists and historians alike have gazed upon the Great Sphinx and pondered its many mysteries. Who built this strange monument? Whose face does it bear? What purpose did it serve? And most bafflingly of all, what happened to its nose? Today, the Sphinx's missing nose has become a popular historical punchline referenced in countless works, from the Asterix comics to Disney's Aladdin. Yet, like so much about the Sphinx, the true fate of this vanished appendage is shrouded in historical myth. Before you go to the comments and say, but Simon, everybody knows who broke it off! Please keep watching, because it's likely not who you think. Despite being one of the most famous and well-documented monuments in the world, surprisingly little is known about who built the Great Sphinx or why. The most commonly accepted theory is that the monument was built during the reign of the pharaoh Khafra, who ruled from 2537 to 2532 BCE during ancient Egypt's Old Kingdom period. Khafra was the son of the pharaoh Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid of Giza, the largest pyramid on the site and in all of Egypt between 2613 and 2577 BCE. Wanting to match his father's achievement, Khafra built his own slightly smaller pyramid along with a sprawling temple complex that was laid out before it. The Great Sphinx forms a central part of this complex, though it is now believed that its construction came about somewhat by accident. The head and most of the body of the Sphinx are composed of soft, nemolytic limestone, too soft for ordinary construction, leading Egyptologists to speculate that the sculpture started out as a yardang, a natural rock formation sculpted by windblown sand. According to this theory, the builders of Khafra's pyramid noticed the resemblance between this rock formation and the head of a man and decided to sculpt the Great Sphinx around it, quarrying down to the bedrock below to create the sculpture's body. This theory is supported by the work of Egyptologist Mark Lenner and geologist Tom Einer, who in the 1980s catalogued and cross-referenced the fossils in the Sphinx's limestone body and the stones used to build the surrounding temple complex. They found that the fossils matched exactly, confirming that the temple stones had been quarried from the area immediately around the Sphinx. None of this evidence, however, conclusively ties the Sphinx to the reign of Khafra or proves that the monument bears his face. Unfortunately, very little written material survives from the Old Kingdom, and what does survive is almost entirely religious rather than historic in nature. In 1814, English polymath Thomas Young reported finding a carved stone slab beside the Sphinx bearing a cartouche or royal seal with the hieroglyphics Kaf, to which Young added the word Ra to complete the pharaoh's name. However, when this tablet was re-excavated in 1925, the cartouche and its accompanying text flaked off and were lost. The most compelling piece of evidence linking the giant sculpture to Khafra is a life-size statue of the pharaoh found in the ruins of the nearby Valley Temple by 19th century French archaeologist Auguste Marier, whose face bears a striking resemblance to the Sphinx's. Marier also discovered the remains of a processional causeway connecting the Valley Temple to a mortuary temple at the base of Khafra's pyramids, helping to further link the two monuments. However, neither of these discoveries is in any way conclusive, and Egyptologists have variously speculated that the Sphinx may actually have been built by Khafra's father, Khufu, or his half-brother, Djafra, or even the pharaoh Amenhotep II some 600 years later. Far more mysterious, however, is the symbolic significance of the Great Sphinx, or even its original name. No records of the mythical creatures, Egyptian name survive from the Old Kingdom, while the modern term Sphinx comes from a similar creature in Greek mythology which appeared some 2,000 years later. What is known is that during the New Kingdom period, between 1570 and 1069 BCE, Sphinxes were known as Harmachet, or Horus on the Horizon. Such Sphinxes, sometimes bearing that of a ram, appear frequently in New Kingdom architecture, such as in the famous Avenue of Sphinxes linking the temple complexes of Karnak and Luxor. As Khafra is known to have closely associated himself with the Falcon god Horus, it is possible that the Great Sphinx was also known as Harmachet during this time. Another theory is that the Sphinx is a reference to the double lion god Acre, who guarded the entrance to the underworld and the horizon where the sun rose and set. Egyptologist Mark Lenner has also noticed some intriguing astronomical phenomena associated with this monument, such as the fact that during the March and September equinoxes, the sun appears to set into the shoulders of the Sphinx and the south side of Khafra's pyramid behind it. Quote, at the very same moment, the shadow of the Sphinx and the shadow of the pyramid, both symbols of the king, become merged silhouettes. The Sphinx itself, it seems, symbolized the pharaoh presenting offerings to the sun god in the court of the temple. Dr. Zaya As, a colleague of Lerner and former Egyptian minister of state for antiquities affairs, concurs, adding that the Sphinx represents Khafra as Horus, quote, who is giving offerings with his two paws to his father, Khufu, incarnated as the sun god Ra, who rises and sets in that temple. 
But without further hard evidence, these explanations remain pure speculation, with James Allen, an Egyptologist at Brown University in Rhode Island, summing up the situation thusly. The Egyptians didn't write history, so we have no solid evidence for what its builders thought the Sphinx was. Certainly something divine, presumably the image of a king, but beyond that is anyone's guess. Whatever the case, it is estimated that the Great Sphinx took a team of 100 people around three years to carve. Traces of red, yellow, and blue paint on the face and pharaonic Nemes headdress also suggest that the monument was originally painted in garish comic book-like colors. However, there is also evidence that the Sphinx was actually abandoned before it could be fully completed. In 1978, excavations by Lenner and Horace uncovered a corner of the Sphinx's ditch that was only partially quarried, along with several abandoned stone blocks, and the remains of a worker's beer jar and toolkit indicating that at some point, the Sphinx's builders had simply walked off the job. As the Old Kingdom came to a close around 2181 BCE, the Giza Necropolis was abandoned and the shifting desert sands eventually buried much of the temple complex. There, the Great Sphinx lay forgotten and buried up to its neck for nearly a millennium. Then, in 1401 BCE, the New Kingdom pharaoh Thutmose IV re-excavated the Sphinx and erected a large granite slab known as the Dream Seal between its paws. The text on the slab tells the story of how, as a young man, Thutmose fell asleep near the Sphinx and had a vivid dream. In the dream, the statue complained of its ruinous condition and made the young prince an offer. If the Mosa cleared away the sand from the Sphinx and restored it to its former glory, the Sphinx would help the prince become pharaoh. Whether this incident actually occurred cannot be known, but what is known is that when Thutmose ascended to the throne, he introduced a Sphinx-worshipping cult to his people. Thereafter, Sphinxes became closely associated with royalty and the power of the sun. At the close of the New Kingdom, Giza was once again abandoned and the Sphinx reburied up to its neck. Though the site was frequently visited through throughout the Greco-Roman period, it was not until the reign of Roman Emperor Nero between 37 to 68 CE that the Sphinx was again re-excavated. In addition, a monumental staircase was erected leading up to a pavement before the Sphinx's paws. The Giza complex continued to be maintained until the reign of Emperor Septimus Severus in 200 CE, after which the site was once again abandoned and engulfed by the sands. While the pyramids and the Sphinx remained popular tourist attractions for the next millennium and a half, it was not until the 19th century that the first serious archaeological excavations were attempted. The first was carried out by Genoese adventurer Captain Giovanni Battista Caviglia in 1817, but this effort was ultimately unsuccessful, the sand sliding back into the hole as fast as Caviglia and his 160 workers could shovel it out. French archaeologists Auguste Marier and Emile Barre succeeded in clearing away some of the sands, but it was not until the late 1930s that Egyptian archaeologist Selim Hassan was finally able to fully excavate the site. By this time, however, the Sphinx had long ago lost its most distinctive feature its nose. Much of popular culture blazes the blame for destroying the Sphinx's nose squarely on one man, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1798, Napoleon and an army of 50,000 men landed in Egypt in order to depose the ruling Ottoman regime and establish a French protectorate. According to the popular legend, it is during this invasion that the Sphinx's nose was destroyed, either deliberately by French gunners as target practice or accidentally by a stray cannonball during one of Napoleon's battles. American conspiracy theorist and black supremacist Louis Farrakhan has even claimed that it was destroyed on Napoleon's direct orders as its distinctly African features challenged European theories about ancient Egypt being the cradle of the Western civilization to quote, white supremacy caused Napoleon to blow the nose off the Sphinx because it reminded him too much of the black man's majesty. However, these legends are just that legends, with little basis in reality. Indeed, there is overwhelming evidence that the Sphinx's nose was already missing long before Napoleon was even born. In 1755, Danish explorer Frederick Louis Norden published a collection of sketches and oil paintings made during his 1737 travels through Egypt and Nubia, which clearly depict the Sphinx without its nose. Furthermore, the deliberate vandalism of the Sphinx is completely at odds with Napoleon's second major reason for invading Egypt. In addition to soldiers and sailors, the emperor also brought along a small army of 167 mathematicians, a astronomers, engineers, naturalists, architects, draftsmen, writers, and printers to meticulously document Egypt's natural and man-made wonders. He also founded the famous Egyptian Institute, whose major 1829 publication, Description de l'Egypte, all but created the modern field of Egyptology. As for the nose being accidentally broken off, the Napoleonic battle most commonly associated with the Sphinx's vandalism actually took place at Imbaba, several kilometers away from the Giza Plateau. 
So, if not Napoleon then, who did break off the Sphinx's nose? The next most popular theory comes courtesy of 15th century Egyptian historian Taki al makrizi who claims that the nose was destroyed around 1378 by a fanatical Sufi Muslim sheikh named Muhammad Sayyim al dar According to al makrizis account, al dar observed a group of local peasants making offerings to the Great Sphinx in the hopes of securing a good harvest. Enraged at this blatant display of idolatry, al dar proceeded to break off the Sphinx his nose. In retaliation, the peasants formed a mob and proceeded to lynch Aldar. Whether or not this story is 100% historically accurate is the subject of considerable debate. However, recent archaeological surveys by Mark Lenner uncovered the remains of holes where rods or chisels were hammered into the nose to break it off. Lenner estimates that the removal was performed sometime between the 3rd and the 10th century CE, quite possibly by Islamic iconoclasts, as al makrizi claimed. Other Egyptologists have speculated that the damage may have been inflicted even earlier in antiquity based on ancient Egyptian beliefs regarding the power of statues and body parts. According to Edward with Bleiberg of the Brooklyn Museum, quote, In temples or tombs, the damaged part is the part that had a function during a ritual. If the ritual required the statue to smell, see, hear, or even eat, then the nose, ears, eyes, or mouth to prevent the ritual from working. But until new records are discovered or the long missing nose is found, we may never know for certain who defaced the Sphinx. But its nose is not the only major component the Sphinx has lost over the centuries. At one point, the statue sported a rare cobra on its forehead and a ceremonial pharaonic beard on its chin, the latter of which was discovered broken off between its paws and now resides in the British Museum in London. Certain early sources also describe the Sphinx as sporting a crown, and indeed the top part of its head bears a large hole that may have been used to anchor this feature. Over the years, the statue has been the subject of a number of indignities both by treasure hunters seeking to penetrate its interior and well-meaning archaeologists attempting to restore and preserve the monument. At some point in antiquity, a long tunnel was bored into the Sphinx's rump and later covered over, while in 1837, British Egyptologists Howard Weiss and John Bering attempted to drill into the statue just behind the head. The drill rods became stark at a depth of 8 meters, while attempts to loosen them with explosives resulted in yet more damage, including breaking off a piece of the headdress, and this is why we can't have nice things. In 1931, in an attempt to prevent further damage, Egyptian engineers shored up the headdress with concrete, creating the now iconic, if historically inaccurate, diamond-shaped profile. Further renovations were undertaken in the 1980s and 1990s to shore up the Sphinx's body, whose soft limestone composition makes it exceptionally susceptible to erosion by windblown sands. While thankfully the Sphinx is now safe from religious iconoclasts, and explosives toting treasure hunters, it now faces a whole new set of dangers in the form of pollution and climate change. In 2007, Egyptian authorities discovered that the Giza water table had risen due to sewage being dumped into a nearby canal. This resulted in water percolating up into the Sphinx's porous limestone body, causing large pieces to flake off. In response, the government installed pumps to keep the ground below the monument dry. Yet despite this, acid rain from industrial pollution still threatens to speed up the Sphinx's erosion, while climate change may cause the level of the Nile to rise, resulting in further destructive flooding. Unless these threats are effectively dealt with, the Great Sphinx may eventually crumble into dust, returning to these smothering sands it has so stubbornly defied for over 4,000 years.